بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين qsep.com Your step-by-step guide to learning Islam online Tawheed explained from the book Aqidat al-Tawheed by Sheikh Saleh bin Fawzan al-Fawzan Presentation and Explanation by Dr. Abdullah al-Farsi Alhamdulillah wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ashadu anna nabiyyina Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh The final chapter of this book by his honor Sheikh Saleh al-Fuzan is devoted to sections about innovations and innovators four sections one is regarding the definition of the innovation its kinds its rules the second session is about the innovators when they started when they came in this nation the third session is the position from the innovators and the path of ahl sunnah wal jamaah regarding replying on the innovators and refuting them and finally some examples of contemporary innovations like the innovation of the Mawlid al-Nabawi the innovation of Tabarruk seeking blessings and the innovations in various aspects of worship first regarding the definition of the innovation its kinds and its rules the sheikh says the innovation linguistically is taken from al bad and that is to innovate means to make up something to make up something new without a set example for it and he quotes the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ which is verse 117 Surah Al-Baqarah بَدِيعُ means the former of the heavens and earth he created the heavens and earth without a previous heaven being there or a previous earth being there and also the verse which says قُلْ مَا كُنْتُ بِدْعًا مِنَ الرُّسُلِ and this is verse 9 Surah Al-Ahqaf say O Muhammad I was not an innovator amongst messengers or I was not a messenger out of nowhere meaning I was a messenger like the messengers before me this is the meaning of the verse and then the Sheikh says innovating is of two types to innovate in habits like innovating the various machines which can be useful for this life like the refrigerator like the car things like that and this is okay because all matters all materialistic matters are okay as long as they don't involve something haram and then the second type of innovation is to innovate in religion to bring something new in religion and this is haram because the uh, rule for this is that we should stop doing or saying or believing anything as a religion 
without a proof. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "He who makes up in our matter, meaning in our religion, what is not from it, or he who brings up in our matter what is not from it, then it is rejected. Then it is rejected." Narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. And in another narration narrated by Muslim, he who acts any act which our religion is not upon or which is not in our religion, then it is rejected. Second, the Sheikh mentions the bid'ahs in religion are of two types also. The first type, the bid'ah, the innovation in belief, in belief, which is the saying of the heart. The belief is the saying of the heart. Like the bid'ah of Jahmiyyah, the followers of Jahm and Mu'tazila and Rafidah and the rest of the innovating sects which are astray. And the second type is an innovation in worship. To worship Allah with any form of worship which has not been legislated for us in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this second type is also divided into several types. The first, an innovation could be in the foundation of the worship itself. That is to innovate something which is not in our sharia at all. For example, to make up a form of prayer which is not in all, no, no mentioning of it in the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Or to innovate a celebration which is not in our sharia at all, like the celebration of the mawlid of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and things like that. The second type is to add to something which already exists, a worship which already exists, to add to it anything. For example, to add a fifth rak'ah to Dhuhr prayer, or Asr prayer, or Isha prayer. This is an innovation. And the third type is to make some worship which already exists in a form different than what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught his nation and different than what the companions were doing. This is also an innovation. For example, to make up form of dhikr after salat in another way than what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught his nation. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught his nation that after Salat, if you say Subhanallah 33 times, for example, Alhamdulillah 33 times, and so on. This is the form, one form which is in Sunnah, and there are other forms which are in Sunnah. But if some people say, we want to make dhikr, we want to say Subhanallah, and Alhamdulillah, and Allahu Akbar, and La ilaha illallah, but we want to make it in a different way. We want to make it collectively. We want to count each Dhikr we say with a, with a bee or with a stone or whatever. And we want to make circles in the masjid. And in the middle of each circle, someone stands up and uh, reminds us of doing this and this and this. So this is creating a form of dhikr which has not been in the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the fourth is to set up a specific time like saying for example the middle of Shaban to make it a specific night for prayer this is an innovation because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never specified the middle of Shaban to be a specific night for prayers so to specify a worship in a certain time and say that in this time, there is more virtue, this needs a proof. And to do it without a proof, this is an innovation. 
Then the Sheikh says, the ruling regarding the innovation in religion is that every innovation in religion is haram and astray. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, beware of all newly innovated matters, for every newly innovated matter is an astray, narrated by Abu Dawood at Tirmidhi, and he said it is Hasanun Sahih, Sahih, true hadith. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, as we mentioned, he who acts in our religion anything which is not from it then it is rejected or who he does something which is not in our religion then it is rejected and the other narration which we mentioned also earlier so those hadiths show clearly that every made up worship in this religion is an innovation and every innovation is a going astray and it is rejected so all innovations in worships and in beliefs are haram. But the degree of haram is according to the innovation of itself. Some of those innovations are kufr. Take someone out of Islam completely. Like the innovation of supplicating to the awliya or seeking blessings in their graves and so on. These are not only innovations, <clears throat> but they are the types of innovations which are synonymous and equal to worshipping other than Allah, which is great shirk. So some innovations could be great shirk, which take someone out of Islam, like setting up intermediaries in dua between you and Allah, like supplicating to the awliya, like seeking the blessings in their graves. All these are great shirk. Like some of the statements of Jahmis, they say Quran is created and things like that. And some innovations are not shirk, but they are haram because they lead to shirk. Like building things on graves, building a room or whatever, on a grave or to make dua supplicate to Allah near the grave and specify that place for being virtuous to make dua yani for someone to go and seek that place to make dua and thinking that this is virtuous this is an innovation and some innovations are neither shirk and nor means to shirk, but they are still haram. For example, punishing one's self by standing in the sun, or seeking that as a means to please Allah, or fasting in a different way than the Muslims fast, and so on. There are some people who divided the innovation into two types good innovation and bad innovation. The Sheikh says, this division is wrong, and this is directly opposite to the statement of the Prophet wasallam that every innovation is a going astray. So how could one say that there are innovations which are not a going astray when the Prophet wasallam said every innovation is a going astray? Al-Hafidh ibn Rajab the great scholar said in his explanation of the 40 hadiths the statement of the Prophet وسلم, Kullu bid'atin dalala, every innovation is a going astray is a short statement with a collective meaning great meanings and nothing is excluded from this generality in the statement of the Prophet وسلم, and it is a great foundation of this religion and this is similar to the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as we mentioned the hadith he who innovates any matter in our religion then it is rejected and this is in Jami' al-Uloom al-Hikam page 233 actually the saying of Ibn Rajab rahimahullah here that this is a foundation of this religion 
uh, some scholars said that this religion is based on three hadiths. First, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ And the second, this hadith that we mentioned today, he who innovates a new matter in our religion, then it is rejected. And some scholars mentioned that their religion is based on four hadiths, and then they mentioned another hadith beside the three hadiths that Ibn Rajab is pointing to. And also, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he said, he amongst you who lives after me will find great differences and great variances. So stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa. And then he said, be aware of newly innovated matters. And he said, every innovated matter is an astray. This uh, statement of the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned it in his farewell or one of his farewell speeches. And the uh, companions in that farewell were affected to the degree that their beards became wet from tears that came out of their eyes because they felt that the Prophet ﷺ was leaving them and because they were affected by the great words in this hadith and especially uh, the hadith about stick or the words about sticking to the sunnah and uh, being aware of the innovations i pointed to this earlier when we spoke about the position of the companions and the and the role of the jama'ah that we recite in surah al-fatiha sirat al-ladina an'amta alayhim o oh allah guide us to the path which is the sunnah then we say Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim The path of those whom you bestowed your bounty upon them Which is the jama'ah But then after that we say غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين So we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala To save us from the path of the wicked The path of the astray people The path of the kafirs And the path of the innovators so we are asking a general dua. We are saying, Oh Allah, make us away from the path of those whom you are angry with and those who went astray. Indeed, innovators fit in the second category. That is, those who went astray. Because those whom Allah is angry with, their problem is not with the knowledge. Their knowledge is true. But their problem is with the action. They know and they act opposite to what they know. Like the Jews. The Prophet ﷺ said, المغضوب عليهم هم اليهود. And the second category, والضالين, those who went astray, the Prophet ﷺ said, the Christians. The problem was not with their action, it was with their knowledge. They were ignorant. They were worshipping Allah in a way which they were not ordered. So that's why they were described to be astray. And the Jews, they knew, but they were acting against what they knew. That's why they were worse, and they were called maghlubi alayhim. And also in the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, stick to my sunnah, and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa, after that immediately he said, وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ And be aware of the newly innovated matters. So these are fundamentals of this religion. Otherwise, they would not be mentioned in Surah Al-Fatiha and in the farewell speech of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he is most concerned to tell his companions what is best for them. Then the Shaykh says, Regarding those who say that there is a good innovation and a bad innovation, they have no proof for what they say. The proof is what we mentioned, the hadith, which says every innovation is bad, every innovation is astray. But they misunderstand a statement made by Umar radiallahu anhu regarding Salat al-Taraweeh, where he said, Ni'matul bid'a This is a good innovation. 
Now, when Umar radiallahu anhu said this, he knew that this is not an innovation that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has forbade us from. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa prayed taraweeh three nights and then he stopped it feeling that it might be made obligatory on his nation. So he stopped it for a reason, not because it is bad, but he stopped making it in congregation for a reason. And then when the Prophet ﷺ died, that reason vanished because there is no more room for making an, any, any new worship or any, any, making any legislation. The legislation has stopped by stopping the revelation. So the uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only did it for a purpose and Umar and the rest of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were great scholars. They understood why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stopped it. And at the time of Umar, radiallahu anh, Umar thought of bringing it back again because there is no fear now that it will be made obligatory. The legislation has stopped by the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So who will make it obligatory? No one can make it obligatory. So that's why Umar radiallahu anh started it all over. He revived it. He renewed it. But why did he call it an innovation? Because linguistically, it is an innovation. Yani, for example, you were not making four rak'ahs after dhuhr. And then, Today I saw you making four rak'ahs after dhuhr and you said, inshallah, I will continue on this. So what you did today compared to yesterday, this is an innovation. But this is not an innovation in the bad sense. It is an innovation in the ling linguistic sense, the linguistic meaning. It is something that you are doing today which was not there yesterday. This is the meaning that Umar radiallahu anhu meant. So what Umar radiallahu anhu meant is that this is something that we started tonight. Last night, the people in the masjid were making taraweeh into groups, each group by themselves, or one person by himself, two persons by themselves. Today, mashallah, all of them are in one group and uh, behind one imam. And يعني, no one is reading loud and making the others feel bad or something like this. Everyone. So uh, that's that's good. This is beautiful. So he liked it, Umar. Eh, he liked this. And he liked it because it was a sunnah anyway. It was a sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ did it for three nights. Then he stopped it for a reason. And then the reason went away. After the death of the Prophet ﷺ, no more legislation. So this is the uh, saying of Umar. To show that Umar radiallahu anhu was very strong against any innovation, we can look into many examples. For example, Umar radiallahu anhu heard about some people in Hajj time who were deliberately making prayers in some places that the Prophet sallallahu made prayers in. And when he heard about that, he got very mad at them. And he said, the nations before you have been destroyed because of following the traces of their prophets, meaning the trace, meaning the positions, the literal positions, a place that the Prophet ﷺ sat in, a place that he prayed in. So to follow their traces is an innovation. So Umar radiallahu anh did not approve what they were doing. And he did not take it easy. He did not say, well, they are making prayers, let them do it, and it's okay, their intention is good, and this and that. No. And he did not say it's a good innovation. Even though it's prayers, and even though their intention is good, they want to make a prayer in the same place that the Prophet ﷺ made. But Umar, despite all that, got very angry, and he said a strong statement that the nations before you have been destroyed by following the traces of their prophets. So this is something haram. <laughs> this is something bad. 
So the saying of Umar is no proof for those people. They also say that the uh, predecessors did not disapprove of certain things that happened after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, like collecting the Qur'an, like writing the Hadith. And the Sheikh says the answer to that, all those matters which they mention have an origin in our legislation, in our Sharia. It is not something which is new. Regarding collecting the Qur'an, the Prophet ﷺ allowed it both by hearts and by writing. So how could it be considered an innovation? The Prophet ﷺ approved of collecting Qur'an by hearts. Anyone who memorized Qur'an at his time was approved of that. And he also approved writing the Qur'an for everyone for everyone. Regarding the hadiths, the Prophet وسلم, approved memorizing the hadiths for everyone. But regarding writing the hadiths, in the beginning, he forbade to write the hadiths as a general statement. Yani not everyone is allowed to write the hadiths. But when some companions sought his permission to write down the hadith, he gave them the permission. Like Abdullah ibn Umar, like Abu Huraira in the beginning, and like many other companions. They sought the permission, like Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-As. He had a book he was writing, and he took the permission of the Prophet ﷺ. Two companions were writing down the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he was speaking in Hajj time, and uh, he was angry, so they felt uh, that since he is angry, they should make sure. And then they asked the Prophet ﷺ, should we go on and write? He said, write down whatever I say, because nothing comes out of this mouth except the truth. So this happened during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So how could it be an innovation? So the, 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 this is not an excuse for them to make innovations, because these are not innovations anyway. So anything which has an origin in Sharia, then if someone calls it an innovation, then this this meaning of innovation here is the linguistic meaning. Just like Umar radiallahu an said about Salatul Tarawih, Ni'matul Bid'ah. This is a good Bid'ah, meaning the linguistic meaning of the innovation, not the legal meaning of innovation. The legal meaning of innovation is to make up something in religion, and that is haram. The Prophet ﷺ said, all that is haram. So regarding collecting the Qur'an, it was already collected at the Prophet's time. Even though it was collected by many companions. And then at the time of Abu Bakr, he ordered Zayd ibn Thabit to collect all what has been written into one text, one book. Some companions, like Zayd ibn Thabit himself, had it written already. But he wanted to make يعني, extra sure. And he went and gathered all what is written, as much as he could. And many companions had it collected in their hearts, all of it. So after the death of the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet wasallam allowed the, the companions uh, I mean, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, the companions started to write down all what they know of hadith. This was no problem to them, and it was no innovation to them. Why? Because at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet prevented writing down the hadith for everyone. He made it only special for some people, because he feared that many people might mix Quran with the Hadith and confuse Quran with the Hadith. So he told them, don't write the Hadith, just write the Quran. But then, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, there was no more Quran coming. And there was also no more Hadith. So again, the reason for this forbidding vanished, just like in the case of Salat Taraweeh. 
that we mentioned. So this was the actual situation regarding the writing down the Quran and Hadith. The second chapter regarding innovations, the Sheikh says, regarding how the innovations appeared in the Muslims' lives and what are the causes which led to it. First, the timing of the initiating of uh, the innovations. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says, most of the innovations occurred towards the end of the Sahaba time. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said. He amongst you who will live long, he said. Meaning, live long towards the end of the companion's time. And this shows that the Prophet ﷺ was informed of this thing. That's why he is foretelling that if you live long, you will see what is different than my sunnah, meaning innovations. And innovations came late towards the end of the Sahaba time. When Ibn Abbas was old and blind, he heard that there are people who say such and such. They had an innovation in Qadr, divine decree. And also the Khawarij, they came in the Khilafah of Ali radiallahu anhu. They didn't come in the time of Uthman or Umar or Abu Bakr, no. They came in the Khilafah of Ali radiallahu anhu, which was towards the end of four Khalifas because Ali radiallahu anhu did not rule that long. Similarly, the Bid'ah, the innovation of Tashayyu, Shi'ism, started in the time of Ali radiallahu anhu. And the Jahmiyyah, they came in the end of the Tabi'i times. The Jahmiya are the followers of Jaham who were denying the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They came towards the end of the Tabi'in time, not the companions, but the Tabi'in, the students of the companions. Jaham came out in Khurasan in the time of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. He was the Khalifa. So these innovations started actually or initiated in the second century, second century of Hijrah. And the remaining companions who were there, they strongly disapproved of those innovations. Ibn Abbas عنهما, was old and blind when he heard about those who deny the divine decree. And he mentioned the hadith which approves of the Qadr and everything is by the will of Allah. And then he said, by Allah, if those people don't believe in this, they will go to hellfire. And then he said, uh, take me to them. Show me where they are. He was blind and old. So they told him, what are you going to do with them? Meaning you are weak and you. He said, if I put my hand on one of them, I would break his neck and I would bite his nose until I cut it. And you see how a strong expression. And he says, I will kill him myself, and I will also mutilate him. I will bite on his nose and cut it. This shows his anger. And this is the Sunni's position from the innovation should be very strong and very clear. And since at that time the Sunnah was strong and it was prevailing and the innovation was very weird and very was very peculiar and was very weak. So Ahl Sunnah were very strong regarding the innovations and regarding disapproving of them and regarding showing their anger. And then the Sheikh says later on uh, great afflictions occurred in the Muslim countries and based on those afflictions great variances in religion has occurred and so many innovations have been introduced like the innovation of Tasawwuf, Sufism, like the innovation of building things on graves and things kept going worse and until يعني, later on things went very bad. Now this is regarding the timing of innovations, how they initiated. Regarding the places of innovations, 
Also, Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah, says that the places which were occupied by the companions of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and therefore the great knowledge and Iman and faith came from are five places. The two Harams, Mecca and Medina, the two Iraqs, I think he means Basra and Kufa, and Allah knows best, Sham, which is now called Syria and so on. And then the Sheikh says, in those uh, places, the innovations started from other than the Medina of the Prophet ﷺ, like Kufa, the bid'ah of Shi'ism came, and bid'ah of Irja, which is to say that the sins do not affect the faith and things like that. And then it spread to other places. And then again, Basra, the bid'ah of Qadr, to deny the decree of Allah, or the opposite of that. That is to say that we are forced to do things and we have no will and things like that. And also the innovations regarding worships came out from Basra again. And also in Sham, there were innovations of hating Ali radiallahu anh, and say, saying bad things about him, which is called a nasb and also the innovation in Qadr. Regarding Tajahum, Jahmiya, it came from far away, and that is Khurasan. And Tajahum, or Jahmiya, to deny the attributes of Allah, this is Kufr. And that's why it came from far away, not from somewhere near Medina, or near Mecca, or close to that. So the further the place was, the greater the innovation that came from, like the bid'ah from Khurasan. And then after the killing of Uthman radiallahu anh, then came the bid'ah of Khawarij. Regarding Medina, it was alhamdulillah, yani pure from all those innovations regarding Medina itself. Because any innovator who would come out there, he would be humiliated strongly and he would have no chance to say his uh, uh, innovation out loudly or to spread his innovation. But regarding Kufa and Basra, like the bid'ah of Shi'ism, they felt strong. So they were saying their bid'ah out loudly there. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the true hadith that the Dajjal will not enter Medina. This shows the virtue of Medina. First, it was almost free from innovations. Second, that the Dajjal will not enter it. And there are many virtues of Medina to the degree that I saw a PhD thesis regarding this. It was about 500 pages, all virtues of Medina. Virtues of Medina. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, من شاء فليموت في المدينة He who can let him die in Medina. The scholars say regarding this hadith, to die in Medina, it's better to live in Medina so that you die in it. So this hadith shows that it is virtue to live in Medina actually and die in it. And also the Prophet ﷺ said, Medina kicks out its hypocrites and cleans itself from the dirt, meaning the hypocrisy and the hypocrites. Yani people who are hypocrites, they cannot take it to live in Medina. They will leave. And also in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, the religion would be restricted to Hijaz and Medina. There are many hadiths regarding this, that the religion will be vanishing from almost every place until it is only in Medina and Hijaz, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. So there are many hadiths and uh, quotations about the companions regarding the virtues of Medina. What are the causes that led to those innovations? The Sheikh says, sticking to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger ﷺ is a guarantee of Savior 
from falling into innovations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is my straight path, so follow it. And do not follow the paths because they will take you away from his path. This is verse 103, Surah Al-An'am. You notice in this verse that the straight path is one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي This is singular, sirat. And when he mentioned the wrong paths, he said, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلْ Subul is plural. So the uh, ways of falsehood are a lot. And the way of truth is one, only one. Therefore, it is not true to say that no one should claim that he is on the right path and others are wrong. If you are a Muslim and following the Salafi Aqeedah, following the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, then you have to know that you are on the right path, even if you were by yourself. Then you are the Jama'ah. As Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, Al-Jama'atu ma wafaq al-haq wa law kunta wahdak. The Jama'ah is what matches the truth, even if you were alone, even if you were by yourself. This is narrated by Ibn Asakir with a true isnad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, this is my path, one path. And then he says, don't follow the paths, the variant paths, which all lead to astray, which are all astray. Also, Allah says in Quran, يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ He didn't say, مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى الْأَنْوَارِ he said, من الظلمات إلى النور. Allah brings you out from the darknesses, meaning all ways of innovations and kufr, darknesses, to the light, to the light, not to the lights. He did not say the lights. He said the light, one light, and that is the way of the Prophet ﷺ. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, that this nation will divide into 73 groups, all of which are in hellfire except one. They said, who is it? He said, Al-Jama'ah. And then he explained it in another narration. He said, it is the group which sticks to what I and my companions are sticking to now. So it's one. And it's very clear. The Prophet ﷺ made it very clear who is this group. So the Sheikh says, the reasons which lead to Innovations can be mentioned in briefly as follows. First, the ignorance about religion, about the religion of Islam, what it is, and about the Sunnah. The second is to follow the desire, to follow your desire, to follow what your heart desires to believe in. This is the meaning of following the desire. If your heart is in love, with believing something, then it's very difficult for you to follow the truth. If what you love is not the truth, how could you get rid of it? So the desire is a very strong cause of innovation. Let's say, for example, a person loves to be tough on people in all matters. That's what he loves. So he picks up the way which matches his desire. And therefore, if you tell him, Allah says, be lenient, Allah says, be gentle, Allah says, be merciful, the Prophet says, be gentle, the Prophet was gentle, the Prophet such and such, nothing will affect him. Why? Because he already has a desire in his heart. And that desire is the harshness in his heart, the false harshness, not the true harshness, which the Muslim has to be sometimes. Yani sometimes the wisdom is to be harsh. And this is not the general thing, but this is an exclusion from the rule. The rule is to be gentle and to be merciful with the Muslims. And also another cause is to blind follow opinions and people, persons, this is a very strong cause of innovations. When you just blind follow someone thinking that whatever he says is true, 
So if someone brings you the proof from Quran and Sunnah, which is different than what this person says, you will not follow the proof. You will keep following that person because this is your way. Like the mushriks did. The mushriks, when they were told by the Prophet ﷺ that they are worshipping other than Allah and that this is kufr, this is shirk, they did not accept. They said, because we are following our, our scholars and we are following our ancestors. This was their excuse, which is not an excuse. Some people, unfortunately, nowadays, believe in something which is clearly against Quran and Sunnah, like supplicating to the awliya, which is great shirk. If you tell him all the verses regarding this, all the hadiths, everything, he will not back up. He says, my scholars have taught me this, my ancestors are doing this, so this is no excuse. If this is an excuse, why didn't Allah accept it from Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab and those people? Those people said this. They said, we follow our ancestors. We follow our fathers. We follow our scholars. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not accept their excuse. Another cause is to resemble the kafirs and imitate them. And this is a very strong cause, again, to fall into innovations. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in a true hadith that this nation will follow the nations before, meaning Jews and Christians, so closely to the degree that if one of those Jews and Christians went into a lizard's hole, some people from this nation would follow them blindly. Yani, what's the use and what's the advantage of leaving your air-conditioned spacious room and go into a lizard's hole and live there there is no no advantage but because some people are so weak and so ignorant that they want to imitate the kafirs and everything and they say it they say it they say it we have to imitate them because they are strong and they are passing us in technology, they have an advanced technology, so we feel that we should follow them. This is not an excuse. So the Sheikh then says those uh, causes again in more detail. First, the ignorance about the rulings of uh, this religion. He quotes the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that Allah does not take out the knowledge from this earth but he takes the souls of the scholars so that when there are no scholars remaining the people would go to ignorant sources and take their knowledge from them and they will go astray this is the meaning of the hadith narrated by Jami' Bayanul Ilm Ibn Abd al -Bar. Volume 1, page 180. So only the scholars are the ones who can confront the innovations. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said, Today, shaitan is very sad. And he, uh, the shaitan wishes nothing more than my death. They said, why? He said, because wherever he goes, he goes to the east and he initiates an astray there. The news of that astray comes to me and I refute it. So shaitan will be very sad because I, I blew up his work and I blew up his job. That's why one scholar is more hard on shaitan than a whole country of non-scholars, Muslims or common people. The second cause, which is to follow the desire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, which is in verse 50, Surah Al-Qasas, if they did not answer your, your call, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so know that they are following their desires. And who is more astray? than he who follows his desires without guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse that is 23 surah al-jathiyah want you look at this person such person who considers his desire to be his god and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has led him astray while the knowledge was there and Allah put a seal on his hearing and on his heart and he put a seal on his eye so who is to guide him after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then regarding the third cause which is to blind follow certain individuals and to blind follow certain opinions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when they are told follow what Allah has revealed they say we follow what we found our predecessors upon and that is verse 170 surah al-baqarah the sheikh says this is the case with a lot of people nowadays who blindly follow the madhahib whether the clear wrong madhahib like sufism and uh, saint worshiping and so on or the other madhahibs which the people stick to the madhab when the truth is shown to them and this is opposite to what Allah said in Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمَ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا He who opposes the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم meaning his sunnah to oppose his sunnah and follows other than the path of the believers, meaning the Sahaba and the companions, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let him down with that which he chose for himself and make him taste severe punishment in the day of judgment. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah said as an explanation of this verse, he said, أَجْمَعَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ مَنْ اسْتَبَانَتْ لَهُ سُنَّةْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لَمْ يَحِلْ لَهُ أَنْ يَدَعَهَا لِقَوْلِ كَائِنًا مَنْ كَانْ It is a consensus of all Muslim scholars that if a sunnah is clarified for you, then you have to leave the falsehood that you were following, which is opposite to it, despite the one who has told you this falsehood, no matter who told you this. You have to leave it. كائنا من كان No matter who told you this thing which is opposite to the sunnah, you have to leave it. And Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah says, if you were told someday that a Shafi'i narrates a hadith and then he chose to act otherwise, other than what's in the hadith, then you should say that a Shafi'i has lost his mind. This is what Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah says. Yani he says there is no way, no situation that I could say a true hadith and then act different from it except when I lose my mind. So he made it very clear. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said إِذَا صَحَّ الْحَدِيثُ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِي When the hadith is true, then that is, that is my madhab. That's why the students of Imam Abu Hanifa has changed a lot of the madhab after him, after the Imam. Muhammad ibn al-Hasan changed two-thirds of the madhab of his sheikh. Muhammad ibn al-Hasan was a direct student of Imam Abu Hanifa. Abu Yusuf changed one-third of the madhab. Yani he left one-third of what he learned from Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. Imam Abu Hanifa himself was saying, don't write everything that I say, I am only a human. I say something today and I might back up tomorrow. And I say something tomorrow and I might back up after tomorrow. So all the Imams, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah said, do not blind follow me or Malik or Shafi'i or such and such. Take from the source which they took from, meaning Quran and Sunnah. Of course, he was talking to his students who were scholars. Yani, students of Imam Ahmed were great scholars. But still, even people like us, we are not scholars. But 
when the truth is shown to us from sunnah and it is clear that this is the sunnah this is the true hadith and this is the true understanding also the understanding of the scholars then we have no way but to follow it and leave what we were following which is different and if you do so you are a true Maliki and a true Shafi'i and a true Hanafi and a true Hanbali because all the Imams were teaching their followers this so who is more true Hanafi someone who says I don't change anything from the Madhab of Abu Hanifa or someone like his direct student Muhammad ibn al-Hasan who changed two-thirds of what he learned from Abu Hanifa can you say now that you are more Hanafi than Muhammad ibn al-Hasan you cannot Muhammad ibn al-Hasan was more Hanafi than you are because he followed Imam Abu Hanifa in the essence of his madhab and that is when the hadith true hadith comes follow it you are not following Abu Hanifa in this you say I am following Abu Hanifa okay in matters of wudu, tahara, this, 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 this but then when we tell you Imam Abu Hanifa says when a true hadith comes then that is my madhab you should follow it you say no I don't dare to, be, to differ from Imam Abu Hanifa in matters of wudu but I dare to differ from Imam Abu Hanifa in this great fundamental of Islam and that is to follow the hadith so this is a contradiction just like someone who says I am a Hanafi and he believes that Allah is not above the throne and he says I am Hanafi Imam Abu Hanifa says about the person who does not believe that Allah is above the throne that he is a Kafir he said this in his book Al-Fiqh Al-Absat and Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar as a matter of fact they said how about those who say we don't say that Allah is not above the throne but we say we don't know whether Allah is above the throne or not he said he is a Kafir this is in his book and those people say we are Hanafis and they say Allah is everywhere he is not above the throne okay and they say we are Hanafis okay Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah was asked is it okay to say oh Allah give me such and such by the honor of the messenger he said no this is haram clearly he said this is haram they said is it okay to say oh Allah give us such and such by the honor of the uh, throne he said no this is haram this is a wrong tawassul this is haram and now people say we are Hanafis and they don't only say this but they say you can call other than Allah you can supplicate to the awliya let alone tawassul tawassul is an innovation which is not shirk but they are doing worship for other than Allah and they say it's okay and we are Hanafis how could you be a Hanafi when Imam Abu Hanifa was a great muwahid worshipping Allah alone following the sunnah of the messenger how could you dare to say you are, Abu, uh, you are a Hanafi you are not Hanafi to be a Hanafi you should follow Abu Hanifa in the matters of belief first similarly those who say we are Shafi's and then they say Allah should not be described that he loves or that he hates and they say we are Shafi'i and Imam Shafi'i says in the beginning of al risala Alhamdulillah alladhi kama wasafa nafsa huh? praise be to Allah the one who is as he described himself and he says amantu billah wa bima ja'an illah ala muradillah وَآمَنْتُ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَبِمَا جَاءَ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ عَلَى مُرَادِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ I believe in Allah and in all that which Allah said in the meaning which Allah meant not in the meaning that we want not in the meaning that we speak and I believe in the messenger of Allah and in all that which the messenger came with in the meaning that the messenger wanted this is a great statement of Imam Shafi'i and those people say we are Shafi'is 
But we don't believe in the verse which says that Allah loves them and they love him. We don't believe it is love. We put something else to it. We put some other meaning to it. So how could you be Shafi? You are no Shafi. You are no Maliki. You are no Hanafi. You are no Hanbali. You are Shaitani. You are following the devil and following your own desires. So the last point regarding resembling the Kafirs and this is one of the great causes for falling into innovations. Like what Abu Waqid al-Layth narrated, he said, we went out with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa to Hunayn, to the battle of Hunayn. And we were new Muslims, we just became Muslims. So we freshly left Kufr. And we found a tree where the mushriks used to come and seek blessings from on their way to the battle. And they would put their weapons on it so that it becomes blessed. That tree was called that one Anwat. So when we passed by this tree, we said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, allow us to have that one Anwat, like they have that one Anwat. Allow us to have such a tree. Even though they became Muslims, but because they just left Kufr, they still had some traces of Kufr and some traces of bad beliefs in their minds. So that's why they asked the Prophet ﷺ this. And the Prophet ﷺ got very angry. And he said, Allahu Akbar. Innaha sunan. This is the path of the mushriks, the path of the kafirs. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, you have said like what the Jews have said to Musa. اجعل لنا إلها كما لهم آلهة Set a God for us just like they have gods The companions of Musa Those who were in the same description they, they just became Muslims, followers of Musa They saw some people worshipping Some يعني, fake gods And they asked Musa to allow them to have the same thing So Musa السلام, said إنكم قوم تجهلون you are indeed people who are in ignorance. And the Prophet ﷺ told those people the same thing. He said, you said what those people said to Musa. And then he recited the verse. So what they asked, that is to have a tree to bless their weapons and to sit under it and get blessed and all that is shirk. Great shirk. But they did not know it. And why didn't the Prophet ﷺ call them kafirs? Because they did not do this. They asked for it unknowingly, thinking that this is okay. Thinking that's okay. So if we are in a place where everyone thinks that supplicating to the awliya is okay, no one says to them it is haram. Neither their scholars, nor anyone else. And they don't hear from any other place. This is a hypothetical situation. It doesn't exist anymore. I don't think so. Except maybe in some cave in the, you know, in Africa or something where no one goes there. Huh? But otherwise, it is a hypothetical thing. Because now, world is open on each other. Radio, TV, people go here and there, Hajj and this and that. So how could some people claim that we don't know this? This is not true. So if we, if we just say for the sake of argument that there is a place where no one knows that supplicating to the awliya is haram, then we excuse them. We don't tell them you are kafirs. We correct them. But we don't tell them you are covers until we tell them the truth. Until the truth is established. But again, this is hypothetical nowadays. So this happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, where some companions, new Muslims, but some companions, 
wanted to resemble the kafirs and establish an innovation. So the Prophet ﷺ got very angry at them and he corrected their attitude immediately.